Hey, everybody. Welcome into a brand new episode of the NFL's day-to-day show here on The Analyst. I am your host, Mike Leon. We've got a big weekend in the NFL. Week 10 already. This is ridiculous. How many how many weeks are we already into this? Uh, uh, we're going to start to break down some of the matchups here coming up this Sunday and all the stats and insights that you're going to hear from us not only come over from the good folks over at The Analyst, but also Stats Perform's amazing new tool called Pressbox Live. You can head to statsperform.com today to see how NFL teams, broadcasters, communication staffs, and more are utilizing Pressbox Live to help augment their game day coverage on Sundays. I mentioned week 10 already. It's hard to believe, but I couldn't do it without my, my three amigos here, right? I'm just one part of the three amigos. First, uh, he's a digital journalist over at The Analyst. You can check out all his work at TheAnalyst.com. Nicholas McGee. Nicholas, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, Mike. Uh, excited to talk some more meaningful games as we get here down the stretch because of the stretch run. That's right. I love the stretch run. And then, then you get the Saturday games, too. You get more football all over the place in places where it shouldn't be. It should always be on Sunday. But anyway. Uh, and then also, he, he's an AI data analyst over at Stats Perform. This guy is the guru of, of spreadsheets at Stats Perform. Knows everything. He's also a contributor over at The Analyst, Kyle Cunningham Rhodes. Kyle, good to see you, my friend. Yeah, happy to be here. Always uh, somebody whose life gets put completely on hold during football season. I have mixed emotions about it being... A little over halfway. I'm uh, sad that there's not that much left, really, but also happy that I get to go back to gardening in a couple of months. <laughs> that was not the response I was expecting there. Uh, that's pretty funny. Um, there's That's the thing. People don't realize working in live sports, like, you know, th- th- you're packed. And then all of a sudden you get January and February and you're like, hey, there's no more of the sport I'm covering. So without further ado, let's get into some of these matchups that are happening here in week 10. A huge Week 10 happening. A couple of pretty good games on the Sunday slate here. We're going to break down a few of these matchups. The first one is the NFL goes to Germany, I believe, for the first time ever. Is that correct? I believe it's the first time ever in Germany. And they're going to get a pretty decent game, right? You get the Seattle Seahawks, and we talked about them ad nauseum in our last episode and the resurgence of Geno Smith. Well, I don't know if it was a resurgence. I mean, he hasn't really done anything up to that point. But anyway, and they take on the ageless wonder who's starting to show his age, Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, I'll start with you first, uh, KCR, because I know we were talking about the Seahawks and how good the defense has played, how good Geno Smith has been, his completion percentage this year. I gave a stat last week about only Drew Brees has done something similar to what Geno has done on this stretch. The Buccaneers, on the other hand, last week, In a matchup, uh, a previous matchup that happened last year in the playoffs, they beat the Rams and they improved to four and five right now. They're tied with the Falcons in the divisional lead, both with losing records. Uh, What are you looking forward to in this matchup in Germany? Yeah, one of the things we did this week was we looked at, uh, so we have team ratings that take sort of multi-year baselines into account. We can sort of project forward and say this player is this good and if you move him from the team, it has this effect. Uh, But one thing that we tried uh, this year was we took just what's happened so far. So if we just look at the data that has occurred in the games, how do the teams rate out? Uh, and the Seahawks were sixth, which is which is a huge number at the start of the year. You know, we we had them sort of in the bottom five. And I think that uh, when we were talking about it earlier, um, we sort of noted that there was a lot of unknowns about the Seahawks, right? Geno Smith, huge unknown. Two starting tackles who were both rookies, huge unknowns. Two rookie cornerbacks, huge unknowns. Um, but really, they've kind of across the board been been huge success stories. Um, I think that the the thing that I'm kind of looking most forward to um, is really the the Tom Brady. What's how Tom Brady fares against that that Seahawks defense? Uh, the Seahawks defense again. We talked about it a lot last week, uh, but they've even gotten more creative since. They're starting to send more creative blitzes. Uh, they're they're using guys in different ways. They're using uh, three safeties on the field a little bit more than they have been. Um, and Tariq Woolen uh, against Mike Evans is really going to be the, the sort of matchup that I'm looking at. I'm not sure how many direct matchups they're going to get. They kind of keep Tariq Woolen on one side of the field. I don't know if they're going to sort of put Evans across from him. Um, this year, he's uh, he's got a, a, an open allowed rate of, of about 26%, and that puts him in the top 15 cornerbacks um, across the entire NFL. Um, man coverage, 26%. Zone coverage, 25%. Really can, can kind of play both. Uh, and is, he's sort of shown his ball skills this year with some with some pretty inse- uh, impressive interceptions. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the the Bucks passing attack, because we know they don't really have a rushing attack, uh, gets going against the Seahawks defense. 
Nicholas, I'll turn to you now. Um, obviously, this game's happening on your uh, hemisphere of the world here. Um, so what are you looking forward to in this matchup with the Seahawks and the Bucks? Yeah, similarly to what KCR said there, it's again, it's the Seahawks defense, Bucks offense, kind of a different look at it. Um, the final drive last week between the Bucks and the Rams, you saw the Rams sat back, they played ultra, ultra soft zone coverage, zone coverage excuse me, I don't know what softer than soft is, but that's how we describe what the Rams played on that final drive. Is let, the, let Tom Brady do what he wanted, effectively. They bet on Aaron Donald, who was phenomenal in that game, um, probably gets lost in the shuffle, the Rams losing it. They bet on him to wreck the game and get and before Brady get the ball out. Brady got the ball out quicker. He won that battle. It was Brady versus Donald. Brady won. Seahawks, he won't play that soft early on. Of course he won't. But the cover six team, quarter, quarter, half. Um, so you, he's, the holes in the zones, maybe there should be there at certain times for Brady to hit them. It, for me, it's just the books can pass protect. To allow him to hit them. Um, their weakness on the on the line is on the interior. Uh, Luke Gadecki's pass blocking rate is a 48%. That's what it's bottom half of the league. Rock center Robert Haynes is 65%. That's not great. But the strength of the Seahawks rush is on the edge with Uchenna Uwosu. Um, tough one to say. Um, they don't really have great interior pass rushes. So it's as Kyle alluded to, um, with kind of the, the twists and the stunts and the blitzes up front, how creative can get can they create that interior rush that can prevent Brady from getting in a rhythm and getting those quick throws against his own coverage. Yeah, and everybody knows if you get to Brady, you can pretty much get to the entire attack. All you got to do is turn on the any Saints game when they play the Buccaneers. Um, before we get into a prediction, let me give you a quick stat and insight presented by Pressbox Live. This is a really good one. The Buccaneers are 0-3 in games played outside of the United States. All three of those games obviously were in London. They've been outscored 96-51 to 51 in those games. If you're wondering, what about the Seahawks? The Seahawks, meanwhile, are 2-0 outside the U.S., outscoring their opponents 77 to 20 and i should know because one of those games was against the raiders um well, let's go to prediction from both of you nicholas i'll start with you prediction seahawks bucks do the seahawks keep rolling here and expand their lead in the nfc west this is a really tough one um I'm not sure what i'm basing this on but i think i'm gonna i'm gonna stick with the brady momentum that we went for last week and say that the, the bucks find a way to pull this out in a really close game give me 24 21 kcr what about you yeah, this is kind of like the ultimate vibes game. The the Seahawks are are just vibing on all cylinders. They're just a, sort of a feel good situation. They all look like they're having fun. And granted, the Bucks did come back and win. Maybe that sort of flipped the script for them. Um, from a pure data perspective, we do have the Bucks winning. Uh, I've got them twenty six to twenty. You know, I'm with you guys. I think the Buccaneers uh, will pull this game out. Uh, give me the Bucks in Germany. Father, the ageless one, uh, gets the victory there in Germany. Um, let's move to our, our next game because this game is probably the game of the day. Somehow it's not in the Sunday night window. If it was in the primetime, excuse me, window, if there was a flex schedule right now, it'd probably get flexed in the primetime, but the Minnesota Vikings who are rocking and rolling, take on the Buffalo bills. Nicholas, I'll start with you. What are you looking forward to in this matchup with the Vikings and the bills? Uh, yeah, I'll go back to referencing the um, the piece that Kyle uh, referred to with the metric about plugging what we, what team has done so far into our team ratings, and it would it suggests that the Vikings should have under four wins. Um, that's probably a f- reflect of the fact that six of their wins have only been by, by have been by one score. Excuse me, um, only for say for a blowout win against the Packers, uh, a team that looks pretty buried. Um, so it's an impressive record, but. If you look at the offense in particular, it's been quite inconsistent. The Vikings are only 17th in our efficiency versus expected metrics. Um, there's a running game when it gets going with Dalvin Cook. It's great, it always does, but the consistency just hasn't been there despite that extremely impressive record. And by that same EVE metric, the Bills have the third meanest defense in the NFL. So this is probably, for, me, for my money, the first true test of Kevin O'Connell's offense. How does it fare against a defense that talent-wise and has been playing like one of the best in the NFL? That's what I'm looking for in this one. You know, you just mentioned that you feed into the follow up perfectly because of stat and insight presented by Press Box Live. Buffalo's allowing 4.6 points per game in the second half of games this year. No NFL team has allowed less than five points per game in the second half over a full season since the Panthers did it in 1996 when they allowed three and a half points per game in the second half. So, just showing what the Bills defense has done in the second half of games, it's a shock to me that they're where they are record-wise. They probably could be undefeated if it wasn't for two divisional losses to the Dolphins and the Jets. Uh, KCR, what are you looking forward to in in what I think is probably the game of the day? I'm with Nicholas. Everyone wants wants to know, are the Vikings for real? Obviously, they have such a huge lead in the division. 
Uh, can they get to the, you know, the aspirational heights that they want to reach? A few years ago, if you remember, they played that huge game against the Saints. They got so far in the NFC conference. Could this team represent the NFC in the Super Bowl? We can talk about the Philadelphia Eagles and, and their undefeated record. But what are you looking forward to in this Vikings-Bills matchup? Yeah, the Vikings have been real strange this year because they their roster is, is littered with good players, right? I mean, they, they even added some more at the at the deadline in, in Hawkinson, who, who was almost a focal point of their offense and it, after just five days after trading for him. Um, I think the, the the defensive line is is really coming on strong. They they sort of dominated Washington last year, uh, last week, um, specifically the two edge rushers, Daniel Hunter uh, and Zadarius Smith. Uh, they're both winning over forty five percent of their one on ones. Um, the really the big question for this game, which we don't have an answer to, is is the health of Josh Allen and, and how he's going to be able to whether or not that injury is going to prevent him from being able to push the ball down the field. Um, the the biggest weakness. Uh, is probably second cornerback for for the Vikings. I know they lost Cam Dantzler last week. Not sure if he's going to play. Uh, I think they put in a rookie, a Caleb Evans, um, who who really was targeted uh, once he came into the game. Um, they do play a lot of sort of cover four and, and quarter quarter half, so they they sort of hide their corners. Uh, they have the ability to do that. Um, whether or not Diggs can get loose for some big ones, or they take some deep shots down the field to Davis, um, again just sort of hinges on. One, Josh Allen's uh, health, but also whether or not that pass rush can can get home. Um, I think the the trenches really on both sides uh, is gonna gonna be huge in this game. Um, the the interior of the Vikings is 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 pretty bad from an offensive line standpoint. Um, they've got some. The Bills have have a pretty good pass rush um, from their defensive tackles. Uh, whether or not Cousins can can sort of stay on his feet, uh, we know he's not really gonna make it make anything happen outside the pocket in the way that Josh Allen can. Uh, whether he can had, can have enough time to to take those deep shots down the field to to both Hawkinson, uh, Jefferson, and Thielen, who who is still a pretty good receiver, um, that's really going to be the I think the the Vikings offensive side is is the side that I'm going to be watching. Uh, the Bills might get Trey White back too. We're not really sure about that one. That would be a huge huge lift to their cornerback room. Um, it's it's going to be tough sledding to for the Vikings offense, but uh, getting even. 24 points up on the board is is going to be great against a, a Bills team. Well, you mentioned TJ Hawkinson before. Um, he had nine catches in his Vikings debut last week. That ties the Bills. Keith McKellar, who did it back in 1987. I mean, who could forget Keith McKellar? For the most receptions by a tight end in his debut with the, with the team in the Super Bowl era. So Hawkinson had a really good game last week for the Vikings. Another stat and insight from Press Box Live. Minnesota has won six straight games, all by eight points or fewer. That is tied for the second longest streak of one possession wins in NFL history. The only other team to do that, the team that I hate the most with my heart, the Kansas City Chiefs did that in 2020 with a seven game streak. Uh, for, to both of you now, KCR, I'll turn to you prediction wise. Vikings, Bills, huge game here, especially for the Bills. You mentioned Josh Allen's status, but they just lost last week to the Jets and, and the Patriots are above 500 in that division and the Dolphins are above 500 in the division. They can't afford to lose a, a home game. They haven't lost a home game so far this year. Vikings are 3-1 on the road. What are you expecting score-wise, prediction-wise for this game? Yeah, this game opened at, at I think, a, a seven-point Buffalo advantage. And it's come down a lot since uh, since some of the injury news has come out about Josh Allen, but, but when we... When I've sort of ran the models at the start of the week and, and even now with Josh Allen in, we still only had the Bills with a three point advantage. Um, I don't think it's going to be a, a super, super high scoring game. I think 25 22 uh, Bills victory. Um, and if, if Case Keenum has to play, I think that that puts uh, the Vikings in a spot where they might actually be favored. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Nicholas, what about you? I know everything's predicated on Josh Allen's health. What do you got prediction wise? Yeah, just that entire mystery makes me think that this is going to be another win that the uh, Vikings get, but it might get perhaps doubted again because Josh Allen wasn't there. Um, it's, people say every week that it's been a really strange season. I think bring on more weird for me this week with a Vikings win, um, given the uncertainty around Allen. 24-20 uh, Vikings for me. You know, it's, a, it's such a tough game. You guys are right. Like This could easily go either way. The Vikings have been surprising. I've gotten to see them up close and personal here in Miami when they beat the Dolphins. I'll take the Vikings in a close game as well, uh, winning up there uh, in Buffalo. Let's move to the game that probably would have been the game of the day before the season started. And now one team is 
trending down. The other team kind of trending a little bit up. The Cowboys head to Green Bay and Lambeau Field to take on the Packers. Aaron Rodgers' team, we've covered it a bunch on this show. They have not been playing well. Three and six record for the Packers. It looks like Aaron is missing somebody who happens to wear silver and black right now and wears number 17. He could sorely use a wide receiver. The Cowboys, meanwhile, have been playing pretty good football right now. They've got some injuries to deal with on their end. Nicholas, I'll start with you. Cowboys, Packers, what should people be expecting here in this matchup Sunday? Yeah, he's not only missing Devontae Adams, he could be missing a, a heck of a lot of people in this one. Uh, just the Packers injury report is insane. Uh, yesterday, Wednesday, first day of injury reports, grand total of 17 players given injury statuses, including Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Jones. I think they're both expected to play, but wide receivers a mess. Uh, Romeo Dobbs, ankle, he hurt in Detroit. Uh, Sammy Watkins, knee injury, Alan Lazard, shoulder. Up front, Bakhtiari, that mystery continues. I'm not sure if he's going to play. Elton Jenkins got a knee injury. John Runyon, the starting right guard, got a knee injury. He was limited in practice, and this is an offense that isn't performing well anyway. Um, they did move the ball against Detroit, um, then gave it away in the red zone with some poor throws by Aaron Rodgers, but they're only 19th in the metric I referenced earlier, the efficiency of expected in pass offense anyway. Um, and they're going against a Dallas offense that looked to be finding its stride the last time they were, we saw them. I think it was to get the Bears last time out, that, that Dallas offense with that pass got really, really good. Um, and just on the Dallas side of things, um, do they see sense and give Tony Pollard more carriers than Zeke Elliott? Because uh, Tony Pollard when it was ridiculous in that game, and he's averaging 3.46 yards before contact. Elliott's only 2.29. Um, and Pollard, uh, Zeke's only averaging under two yards after contact as well, and Pollard's well above that, one of the best in the league. So I think it's time to see sense in Dallas there, but I think regardless of what they do in that situation, this should be a situation where they can win quite comfortably on Mike McCarthy's return to Lambeau. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Let me give you a stat and insight on Tony Pollard here, presented by Press Box Live. Pollard, you were talking about, he rushed for 131 yards against the Bears. He was getting 9.4 yards per carry. It was his second career game with rushing average of above nine yards on 10 or more carries. Only the legendary Tony Dorsett had four such games in Cowboys history. So Pollard needs to get a little bit more of the football. He probably will get a lot more of the football up in Lambeau Field. KCR, what about you? I mean, this has been uh, an anomaly of a season under Rodgers here in Green Bay. The injury report that Nicholas just alluded to, 15 to 16 players listed on there, a bunch of critical positions on the defensive and offensive side of the ball. What are you expecting in Sunday's matchup between the boys and the Packers? Just a slog fest, I think, is really the – what it's going to be and i think that uh nicholas really he brought up a great point with with aaron jones especially if, if they're missing aaron jones who was he was in a walking boot at the end of the last game i think that got a lot of good news on his injury uh, throughout the week but whether or not he plays uh i think is a is 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 huge he's he adds uh with each rush that he has uh he adds an extra 3.75 yards um he's he's uh Defenders are only successful 71% of the time against him when they're when they're trying to tackle him. He can really get a bunch of extra yards, and he's that sort of explosive playmaker that they just do not have right now um, in the rest of the team. Um, one of the things that we do is we take we have a, a sort of quarterback agnostic offensive rating and a uh, defensive rating, and we can sort of compare the two with the with the matchup. Uh, and this week the Packers have the second worst matchup uh, across the entire league. Worse, uh, the only one worse is the the Cardinals against the Rams. Uh, the, the skill position players that they have, the, the offensive line that they've been uh, just sort of shuffling through guys as injuries have been happening, they've, they're really, you know, Rodgers has not had the supporting cast that he's had in years past. Um, that doesn't excuse some of the things that, that he's done. Um, that, that pick that he threw last week uh, to, with the intended pass to Bakhtiari where he just sort of lofted it in the air and uh, Aiden Hutchinson came down with it. Uh, I have no, I really just haven't seen him do that uh, throughout his entire career. Um, and even the, the other pick that got tipped at the line of scrimmage, I mean, it was tipped because he threw it directly into a defender's face mask. It wasn't a defender really making a play. It was just him hucking a ball directly at a guy. Um, it's it's just been kind of a mess for them. Um, I think that the, the, the injuries that they've suffered on defense, I think that sort of if they had a healthy defense heading into this game, I think it was it would – make it a little easier to sort of keep it close. Um, I still think that it's going to be uh, a really close game, uh, but gosh, low scoring, low scoring, low scoring. Um, and I think that the the Cowboys can really just live on the ground and, and pound the rock with, with uh, Zeke and Pollard. 
Yeah, I think the Cowboys will lean on them and eventually get them to tap out. If you get that MMA reference, uh, let me give you another stat and insight uh, presented by Pressbox Live. Packers have lost five straight games. We've talked about the losing streak. We've talked about how flustered Rodgers has looked, how the team has looked overall. They've been averaging 15.8 points per game during this losing streak. It's the first time that the Packers have lost five games in a row while averaging fewer than 16 points per game since the 1990 season. Back then, that was week 13 through 17, where they averaged that same amount of points and lost five straight games. Uh, With that said, KCR prediction, uh, do the Cowboys pull out a close victory or are the Packers going to right the ship here and improve their record? Uh, we do have we do have the Cowboys favorite. I think it would be uh, if this was in Dallas, it would be a significantly different projection. The the Packers, uh, or I should say, Lambeau Field has has our third um, highest home field advantage across the league. Um, the fact that it's there is is really going to help the Packers. They, it's just such a hard place to play. Um, we do have uh, we do have the Cowboys coming out victorious, twenty two to twenty. Nicholas, what about you, prediction wise? Yeah, I'm. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm glad uh, KCR referenced that Bakhtiari uh, interception, one of the funniest plays of the year, um, quite emblematic of the uh, Packers season, and I don't see it getting any better here. I think it'll be close for a bit, but I think the Cowboys will pull away. Um, give me 24-14 to Dallas. Yeah, I like the I like the Cowboys too, Paul. I almost said the Packers. Uh, I do like the Packers uh, two years ago, um, but it's this time around, and I like the Cowboys uh, in this matchup. Um, so we're on the boys. Let's move to our final matchup. Another good, pretty game. Another pretty good game on the slate. This is the actual Sunday night uh, game here on the East Coast time. I know it's going to be early morning for Nicholas, but he will be wide awake as his 49ers welcome in the LA Chargers. Probably another game that before the season you had circled on your calendar. So far, these teams, a couple of mixed bag of results. Nicholas is going to get into the Niners mixed bag in a second. The Chargers winning their game last week against the Falcons. And what you want to you want to laugh about funny plays, that Falcon fumble and then <laughs> and then the recovery by the Chargers could be the funniest play I've ever seen in NFL history. The Chargers are five and three. They're sitting there. A game back of the Chiefs. The Niners are four and four in the division. We just mentioned about how the Seahawks have played in the division in the first game against the Buccaneers. Nicholas, I'll start with you because you've probably done the most research on what your Niners need to do to win here. But take the audience into Chargers and Niners happening Sunday night. Uh, yeah, you nailed me there. This is the one with my longest notes on my uh, notepad here. Uh, but, and this is the one I'll be up until 4 or 5 a.m. watching. Um, easy one for me. The uh, thing I'm most excited by is how does this Niner offense look with both Christy McCaffrey and Debo Samuel on the field at the same time. Um, McCaffrey, incredible in his second game against the Rams, his first full game after his cameo against the Chiefs. I don't know, he threw for a touchdown, ran for one, caught one. That's uh, Walt Payton, Ladini, and Tomlinson territory. He showed explosiveness, burst, elusiveness in the run game. It also gave Jimmy Garoppolo a critical out in the passing game. Garoppolo, Garoppolo was so much more composed and went to go for his progressions to get to his check down because he had the faith that McCaffrey would make a man miss and pick up yards after the catch, and he consistently did it. Uh, in that game, you saw the Niners, even without Debo, line up in what they call pony personnel, which is two true running backs in the field. They did that a lot with Jeff Wilson, who was traded to the Dolphins last week. Now you can do it with Debo, who obviously isn't a traditional running back, but he's a self-titled wide back. Um, and they're also getting Elijah Mitchell back from injury. He's been out since week one uh, with a knee injury, so you can plug him in there too. And it's just the stress of having two bona fide running and receiving threats in McCaffrey and Samuel in the backfield. The incredible stress that puts on defenses with somebody like Cal Shannon and Cohen plays um, is going to be really intriguing to watch. And it, it couldn't be, could hardly be a more ideal opponent in terms of where the Chargers struggle as well. The Chargers give up 5.7. Yards per play on the ground, which is the worst in the NFL. So the stars look to be aligning for the Niners in this game, but they've got to find the consistency that was kind of lacking in the first half of the season for them. You mentioned the McCaffrey that he threw uh, and rushed and caught a touchdown in that win against the Rams before the the uh, Niners had their bye. He's the first player to do so since Chargers Ladanian Tomlinson did that back in week six of the 2005 season. So with that, KCR, uh, what are some of your keys to Sunday's matchup here between the Chargers and the Niners? Oh, this game. Um, <laughs> I think the it's just it might look ugly for the for the Chargers and it, the some of the some of the data about specifically their run defense. Uh, we've talked about it in, on on uh, previous episodes of this. Uh, they're really just not doing it from from either a defensive line or a tackling standpoint. I mean, they're uh, they're they're sort of pre yards per carry, which is which is 
uh, how many yards opponent running backs get or opponent ball carriers get before they first interact with the defender. So rather than just looking at yards after contact, um, as soon as they, you know, if, you, if you miss a tackle, they got us in touch you, that's still counted as wherever that guy first interacted with the ball carrier. Uh, bottom half of the league in that. Once that interaction actually happens, second worst 4.1 uh, yards uh, allowed until the, the play is complete. Uh, only the Texans is worse than that. Um, with guys, with, with two players like Debo and McCaffrey, who, who are really good at making defenders miss, um, the Liners might really just just live on the ground in this game. Uh, the you know JC Jackson uh, in the defensive backfield for the Chargers has been has been not good, and now he's hurt. Uh, but that pass defense is still pretty good, um, and I think that living on the ground is 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 really how they're going to uh, control this game. Um, on the other side of the ball, it's really the 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 injuries that the Chargers have had at the tackle position this year are, are really terrible. They they lost all pro right to, or left tackle Rashawn Slater earlier in the year. Um, Jamari Salyer has been pretty good as a replacement, but he's not an all pro left tackle. Um, they've been shuffling through different right tackles. It looks like uh, Trey Pipkins is probably going to miss. Um, that's, that means uh, normally it would mean Storm Norton time, which is which is not good. Um, but uh, it sounds like a undrafted practice squad player uh, might get the nod in front of him. Um, watching him go up against Nick Bosa in this game is going to be just uh, it's not going to be a good sight from the if you're a Chargers fan. Um, I think the the last little bit that I want to look at is is what the Chargers passing game looks like. The, their running game just doesn't exist. They don't really have a ball carrier who's who's sort of a between the tackles guy who can uh, who can tote the ball a bunch. Uh, but Eckler is a really really good weapon in the passing game. He's he's one of the most highest used running backs uh, in in the passing game uh, across any team. Um, but the thing that the Niners do really really well on defense is they suppress running back targets. Uh, their their linebackers are fantastic. Their safeties drive hard down the field. Um, that matchup of, of if they take Eckler out of the game from a pass catching standpoint, who do they rely on down the field? Josh Palmer was the guy last week. Uh, DeAndre Carter in the slot was used a little bit, but he is just kind of not in the right spot sometimes. Um, the 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 answers to the clock control that the Niners are going to have, the the Chargers are really going to need to put together some explosive plays. And that's a really, really tough thing to do when you can't pass protect and when the defense can take away your best weapons. Well, before you both make a prediction on this, let me give you a stat and insight that Chargers fans, maybe it'll help you here because Justin Herbert wasn't sacked in that game against the Falcons and LA has allowed the fewest sacks in the league this season. But if you're wondering they haven't allowed 10 or fewer sacks through eight games since 2008. So that was the year when they also had the fewest sacks in the league up until this point. So if you're a Charger fan out there, maybe if you keep Herbert upright, he can deliver a victory for you guys. And here's another stand insight about the Chargers and Niners uh, history. Chargers are looking to win their sixth straight game in this series. It would make the first time that they've done this to a team since the Seahawks when they beat the Seahawks nine straight from 2014 to 2018. So, Nicholas, you heard that. Chargers have the Niners number, apparently, according to stats and insights from Press Box Live. KC, our prediction uh, score-wise here in the Sunday night matchup to end week 12, not until the Monday night game, but the, the Sunday night game for, for week 10. What do you got, Chargers, Niners? I've got the Niners pulling it out. I got 25-18, Niners. Nicholas, what about you? Uh, we probably already know what you're going to pick, but what are you going to pick? Give us a uh, surprise us here. Uh, I don't think I'll surprise you. The only thing that gives me pause uh, is how terrifying Justin Herbert looks when he's throwing the ball sometimes. Um, the Chargers off first and Pre- doesn't impress me about design. It's not, not particularly special in that way, but he is special. It looks like he's still playing at Oregon sometimes with how it's drawn up, but he can just make some incredible throws and that's the one thing that gives me pause, how terrifying he can be. Having said all that, I think the Niners have got too much of an edge here. I've got it 27-17 San Francisco. You know, I know well hand, uh, firsthand, excuse me, how Herbert can extend drives and get fourth down completions of over 15 yards or more four consecutive times. If you watched that game last year between the Raiders and the Chargers, one more stat before I make my prediction, Herbert has accounted for 90 touchdowns in his 40 career starts. Only Mahomes, Dan Marino, and Kurt Warner have accounted for more scores in their first 40 starts respectively than Justin Herbert. So he's in pretty good company. Having said all that, I like the Niners in this matchup. Something about the Niners at home in a primetime game that I've seen them over the last couple of times, they pull it out. It doesn't matter the opponent. 
they tend to pull it out. I think this starts the trajectory for the for the Niners and they start their stretch run here. And they get back to where they should be probably in the AFC uh, pecking order here. Um, before we sign off here, real quick from each of you guys, we talked about this maybe a few weeks back about the NFL MVP so far. For each of you, uh, I'll start with you, Nicholas. Who's somebody that you're still thinking of in this MVP race? It's been pretty wide open now. We just mentioned about Allen's injury. The Bills obviously are only 6-2. and two. The Vikings have had a really good resurgence. The Eagles are 8-0, and, and everyone's now talking about Jalen Hurts. Who's somebody on your radar for NFL MVP so far? Yeah, I've had Josh Allen all this way. I've been in Josh Allen every week. And then until we've seen in the last couple of games, even with the injury, quite careless of the ball in the last two games. Pretty two underwhelming games against the, the Packers. That kind of flew under the radar because he won so handily that he was pretty below average in that game. And then against the Jets last week as well, he was pretty careless of the ball again. Meanwhile, you've seen Patrick Mahomes uh, was absolutely incredible in week seven against my Niners, um, throwing the ball. And then last Sunday against the Titans, putting the team on his back with his legs in that overtime thriller. Um, no Tyree Kill, but he's got a new group of receivers, Juju, Juju Smith-Schuster and uh, Marcus Alice scantlin who's developing excellent reports already, still making sensational plays and confound, confounding defenses like that of the Titans that do nearly everything right to stop him and still can't do it. Um, he's showing the entire league why he's the pre- preeminent quarterback of this era at the minute. Um, so he's my MVP. He's, he's leapfrogged down for me. Couldn't disagree with any of that, unfortunately. Uh, and it pains me to say that. KCR, what about you? We know how high you've been on the Eagles you sing fly, Eagles fly every time you come on before we start taping. So who's your MVP candidate so far? I mean, it is, it is Mahomes. Um, but in the interest of, of good conversation, uh, I will pick somebody else. Um, I'm going to go non-quarterback, and I'm going to say Tyreek Hill. Uh, Nicholas mentioned Tyreek Hill in a different way just now. Uh, but the the what the Dolphins have been able to do uh, with their pass offense this year is, is – is, Tua is, re- is good. He's he's a quick decision maker. Uh, the type of offense that he excels in is the type of offense that Mike McDaniel is is running. Um, and really, what makes that click is both Tua's skill set and having Tyree Kill on the field. Um, he's he's not only the most used wide receiver. We have a we have a data point called Read Share, um, which looks at uh, what percentage of the time a player is on the field, are they a part of the passing concept? So are they basically being looked at by the quarterback as an option on the play? Um, Tyree Cole leads the league uh, 71% of the time. Um, so seven out of 10 times that he's on the field, he is a part of the passing concept. Uh, down the field, he's he's a yards after the catch monster. Uh, he wins against man coverage. His, his man coverage win rate is, is 68%. Uh, that's among the top in the league. Uh, his zone coverage win rate is, is 44%. That's also among the top in the league. Um, he's just been really the catalyst for what that offense has been able to do. Um, the quick decision making from Tua um, and then the, the ability to just throw to the wide open receivers who are open because they are really good and really fast. Um, it's, it's interesting to watch that game, uh, specifically the game last week against the Bears. Um, I made a joke that it's sort of, I have to check to make sure my video is playing on full speed when I switch offenses because the, the Bears wide receiving core just looks like they're running in slow motion compared to what the Dolphins have. Uh, and Tyreek Hill is, is really the reason I think that the, that the Dolphins have, uh, are in the situation that they're in. Yeah, that was a fun game to watch. If you if you love scoring points there, and then what McDaniel's whispered to Justin Fields too on one of those runs, it was pretty funny and went viral. Um, two interesting picks there. I like the Mahomes pick as well. Unfortunately, I just think Patrick Mahomes when it all said and done, the Chiefs will somehow figure out their way into a one or maybe two seed in the AFC, and he'll probably be the MVP of the league. As much as it pains me, right here, guys. As much as it pains me to say that. Uh, my thank yous to Nicholas McGee, Kyle Cunningham Rhodes. They're both contributors over at The Analyst. You can check out all their work at theanalyst.com. And also, you can check out all the stats and insights that we read on the show today, courtesy of Pressbox Live. You can head to Pressbox Live today to see how NFL teams, broadcasters, communication staff, and more are utilizing Pressbox Live to help augment their game day coverage on Sundays. For KCR, for Nicholas McGee, I am Mike Leon. Thank you so much for watching, listening to the NFL Day-to-Day show presented by Stats Perform. We'll see everybody next time.